the city, both Sarah TV and Cameron American Council, we've been speaking with Africans about um, did you get any funds uh, or did our community organizations get any funding through the Sandy Relief? Mm -hmm. Did, um, you know, do we have, you know, African immigrants, um, I, I believe um, Sadiq alluded to that, African immigrants who have city contracts in terms yeah. of vendors or government contracting. No, yeah. You know, we, we um, as African immigrants, actually nationally, we're the most educated Americans, 40% of folks who are self identify mm -hmm. as um, African immigrants or first or second generation get um, uh, have 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 college education the national mm -hmm. average is about 80 mm -hmm. to 22 percent yet here in New York City um, zero percent of nominations mm -hmm. for judiciary for for boards for commissions are, are, are African immigrants so the half a million African immigrants here in New York would like to find out so this this question I'm, I'm gonna start um, with Daniel since you had mentioned um, you know folks who do not have lobbyists. What can we do as African immigrants? What can this office do? Um, if you look at some other models from around the country, um, Washington DC, for instance, only has 16,000 African immigrants, yet the, the mayor of uh, Washington DC has an office of African um, immigrant um, affairs. And um, this one person, um, Gozi, who happens to be my colleague out there, um, and, and her team, connect the 16,000 African immigrants in Washington DC to the city services, being that we're the most recent, um, we, we, you know, we're, we're the most recent immigrants, so we're the most vulnerable, really. You, you, both year, especially here in New York City. Um, if you go to 116th, with our Senegalese, um, you know, Staten Island, our librarians, we, we're really the most vulnerable. So as you're thinking about the different, um, the different positions you're going to have, as you're thinking about the most vulnerable. What can African immigrants do, or would you consider, like Washington D.C., like Montgomery County, um, yeah. you know, in Maryland, like um, uh, Philadelphia has an African commission, um, Mayor Cara Booker has an African commission. Would you consider an African commission, or an African, um, or, or an immigrant, uh, or maybe specifically an African uh, coordinator, who would link Africans with city services? Uh, and I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to let uh, you know the other candidates as well. Okay. So. And it's a big question, and there's a there's a lot a lot to say to it. You know, I think you've really put your finger on on one of the things that that I talk about everywhere I go in this race, and that you see in the city. This is, in in many ways, has the potential to be the greatest city in the world. I think uh, I'm proud to be a New Yorker. Proud that I'm here because my grandfather him, himself was an immigrant, and my father climbed the ladder from deep poverty in this city to give me opportunity that couldn't have been imagined uh, a generation earlier. That's, that's a story of what New York should be and is at its best, and we risk losing. And I think sometimes our size is, is one of the reasons for that. Uh, enormously significant communities, even communities that are a significant percentage of the city, uh, really don't have the kind of access, the kind of results out of government they need. You know, you mentioned Sandy. And uh, in my district, I represent a waterfront district in both Brooklyn and Manhattan. And in my district, you know, we really saw the effects of uh, an event that just hadn't been sufficiently planned for. And I think where uh, the reaction uh, to it, you know, showed real gaps. And you know where those gaps ended up? Uh, among the communities who uh, had the highest rates of poverty, uh, the highest rates uh, of uh, immigrants in them. You know, you travel around my district and you can really travel around the world. We have Polish immigrants and thousands of Polish immigrants in Greenpoint and uh, tens and tens of thousands of Chinese immigrants in, in lower Manhattan and, and folks from all around the world. But the one thing district. about, um, so being most recent immigrants, um, we cannot be half a million and zero percent in every other you know, 0% in funding, 0% in nominations, 0% in, in, in government contracts, 0% in, um, you know, I mean, you, you name it, uh, uh, in, in, in appointments for, for, for nominations. So being a, we're, so clearly we're, we're vulnerable. Would you then, um, do you think there is a possibility in the, uh, I believe the budget's about 2 million for this office. Is there a possibility for, um, for 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 an African coordinator that would that would connect clearly our most vulnerable New Yorkers with city services is that is that that's a question I'd like for for everyone to answer and, and, and you know and, and it's you, you need to in this office not just sort of sit there and wait to answer the phone and say oh what are the problems coming in you need to figure out how to get out there 
proactively and partner with communities, especially those communities that are the most vulnerable, as you say, or uh, have sort of the least reason to trust that going to city government and city services will really make a difference in their lives. And we talk about the African immigrant community in New York, uh, the variety of communities that make up the African immigrant community in New York, there's no question that that need is there. And it's about uh, proactively going out and partnering with communities on issues that are otherwise overlooked. And if you look at the proposals that I have for the office in each of the four offices, advocacy offices that I've proposed, you know, you, you talk about issues like uh, continuing and expanding the uh, worst uh, landlords watch list, which you know is, is something that we know impacts immigrants, uh, uh, both documented and undocumented, uh, more at a much higher rate than any other uh, community. Uh, you look at uh, empowering parents in the school system so that rather than parents having to fight their way, their way in, there are structures where they really can have a voice and a say. You talk about the fact that uh, we have uh, thousands of day laborers and we don't have the kind of worker centers that uh, you see even in places much less progressive than New York. And bringing those issues together uh, by reaching out to communities such as the African immigrant community as an absolutely critical part of the office. And I'll give someone else a chance, but I wanted to just, just say one more thing. You know, my Senate office, one thing that we've done every year is what we call a community convention. We invite everyone in my district to come and join us for uh, an annual convention. We meet together and sort of have a brief welcome. And then we break up into 25 different discussion groups in three different languages. And it's really an opportunity based on subject area for folks in the district and in the community to come and raise their issues and make sure that communities' needs are not left out. You know, that is a big part of helping to drive the priorities in the district, in the legislature, uh, over the course of the year. And uh, I, that's one of the things that public advocate has to do. It has to not just listen, it has to also reach out, and then it has to make sure that it's not just taking on these issues, but getting results on them. Thank you. We, we, we hope that would include uh, hiring African immigrants mm -hmm. and reaching out to them as well. Uh, Sadiq? This, this issue is very personal to me uh, because not only am I running for this office, but I also represent, as the national president and spokesperson for Africans born in Africa in this country. So I have a personal uh, knowledge and interest in this subject. Let us be clear, when you want to empower a community, you don't do it by commissions, you get them involved. It is very, very important for New York City and America to know that immigrants coming to this country are making a valuable contribution to this country and they are partners. So partnership does not mean appointing commissions that have no funding, no money. Partnership does not mean you hire one African based upon the fact that you want to show the public that you have somebody on staff. I work for the police uh, department. If the police commissioner did not give me the opportunity and give me also the authority to serve the interests of my community. And by serving the interests of your community, you have to be in a position in which when you make policy recommendations, those policy recommendations are gonna be taken and acted upon, not just let it be a research ideology. Sandy, when there was Hurricane Sandy in the city, everybody was saying, well, whenever something happens in developing countries, you see them sending monies. What did we do? We, under the leadership of uh, the Congress, United African Congress, give them a hand foundation, faith-based organization. We mobilize over 350 volunteers from the UN throughout the city to say, hey, our neighbors are suffering. So we were in communities not taking pictures we were in communities distributing food, trying to help people. That program, by the way, was one of the most successful programs. And at the end of that process, we also collected monies to give to people who were suffering. 
what would I do differently? Look, there are billions of dollars of contracts the city gives every year. Take Brooklyn, which is my home state, call it a state. Patricia and I come from that state. I'm very proud of that state. Thank you very so much. Does. And my son. And my yes. son. Uh, in, in, most importantly. In Brooklyn, you have the labor, you have the West Indian Day Carnival, wherein they put five million people on the parkway. 37, 34 years later, you don't even have a museum wherein people could come and see the cultural diversity of our people. What I will do as a public advocate, if we can put five million people on that parkway, I would say a week after that, we are going to, everybody who has a city contract, we're gonna create a job fair right there. I'm saying, I'm not asking you to give me the world, so do you support an um, Office of African Affairs or like a coordinator that can connect um, Africans with city services? Because clearly, being the most vulnerable, a lot of um, pretty much every other community in New York City has representation, um, be it in city contracts, be it in funding, be it in, in appointments, judicial appointments or commission uh, on the boards. You know, how can we get the most vulnerable New Yorkers that really are African immigrants um, to um, be part of, of, of our great city and be part of, 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 of you know, and so our tax dollars can really um, work into our communities. You see, the, let's be clear, the Office of Public Advocate is not the Office of the Mayor. There are two distinct positions. We, in that office, could set a moral tone to encourage us. I will First of all, particularly in the area of opportunities. There are a lot of NGOs now in the city. I run an NGO myself that don't have any funding. If you're not connected to some political entity or some, some entity, you could write the best proposal, you're not gonna get it. So is that a yes or no? So we can yes, move on. So <laughs> do, okay, good. What I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna urge that every city council person who is elected put in a fund, a certain percentage of their legislative initiative fund, so that those organizations who are doing valuable work in the city, and there are plenty of them who do not have a godfather somewhere, if they can apply to that independent fund and they meet the criteria, they too should be allowed. Wonderful. So let me answer your, answer your question. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. A direct now, answer. <laughs> I'd lobby the next mayor of the city of New York to create an office for African affairs, period. Why? Because I've seen it up close. Could you speak into the mic? Sure. Yeah. I've seen it up close. Um, I would create, I would urge the next mayor of the city of New York to create an African affairs office and staff it because I've seen it up close. And I want to give Sadiq credit. Um, Sadiq has worked with me in a large development in my district. It's called Ebbets Field. Several years ago, Africans were being assaulted. They were being robbed. They were being um, hurt. They were being robbed of their meager means. They would come home, um, and they would be robbed in the elevator, in the stairwell, and on the streets. Um, we convened a meeting. Oftentimes, they did not report these crimes to the police. Uh, language barriers were a problem. They had a distrust of government, clearly. They spoke only amongst them. Um, they were a close-knit community. Um, and it continued to be a problem. They would call my office and hang up. They called Sadiq, they called others. Sadiq reached out to me, we had a meeting, we pulled them all together. And what we needed was sensitivity, cultural sensitivity. What we needed was an understanding of that community. What we needed was someone who had the ability to translate for them and who could um, break down the walls of dis mistrust. Sadiq was very helpful. 
The police were very helpful. But I must admit, it was the women within that African community who were outstanding, um, who helped me bridge the divide and who assisted me in getting them assistance, particularly, I always remember, one woman who was raped in the elevator. And I, I worked on that for a very long time because that was personal. It's, that's what a public advocate can do. Not sit in an ivory tower, but someone on the ground. And I've always been on the ground. Another instance. We're overrepresented in the criminal justice system, people of African ancestry, be they from the diaspora or African Americans in general. We are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. And what we need is a team of attorneys who can advocate on our behalf and who know the Constitution and the criminal code like the back of their hands. That's key. Three, I drafted Article 15A of the Executive Law of the State of New York, which is the Affirmative Action Law of the State of New York. In addition, I drafted and served on the Contracts Committee and was key to the bill that was just passed in the City Council. How do you think, uh, so? We've done terrible. Okay. This mm -hmm. administration has done horrible. Every year we have a hearing, and the numbers are as follows. Zero, 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 one percent. You know where we do go well in the Department of Corrections? It's abysmal. And why is it? It's something that I believe someone touched on. There are no procurement officers of color. None. It's not a priority from this administration. When you said zero, you mean zero African Americans, which would include there African Americans. There's there's African no immigrants. Col color at all. When I was critical of the administration and said that his administration looked like the, you know, the snow-capped mountains of Colorado, all of a sudden he appointed some African Americans, about four of them, four men. But that was just at the top. The bottom line is we need mid-level managers. We need people who are making decisions on the ground. We need to make WMBE a priority of the next administration. We need to hold their feet to the fire. We need to have audits and audits and audits. And we need to make sure um, that there's a face and, and a, uh, a cadre of co contractors who can do the work. And they're out there. Wonderful. You just need to be <clears throat> on the ground. And unfortunately, this administration is not on the ground at all. Thank you. What, what, what would you say? What, how can we get the most variable, the most vulnerable um, New Yorkers, right. including, which really includes our African immigrants, can we get an Office of African Affairs, the auto model cities? Well, I think first let's start about talking about how you get your fair share, right? Because we know that our community-based organizations, our nonprofits, that we receive no funding, little to no funding from the city council at all, right? The numbers across the board are abysmal. And so you gotta start by looking at who your elected officials are in communities where you have a high concentration of African immigrants and look and see what they've been doing. How many resources have they secured for the community? How do, and, and, and when we are in powerful voting blocks and we have the opportunity to use our vote to demand resources, we must do that. And so that's where I feel like we have to start is through our own political activism. You know, I, I will be, not only the first, you know, daughter of, you know, of African immigrants to, 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 you know, to win public advocate, right? But also the first South Asian. And we talk about this all the time, right? How little the community gets, but also how little we vote and participate in the political process. And we're having an awakening right now with this election and, and organizing and making sure that our voices get heard. The MWBE is, is a major issue. When I did a survey of immigrant and minority entrepreneurs, we found that the majority of, our, of the immigrant entrepreneurs that we surveyed thought MWBE meant you had to be a minority and a woman. Can you believe that? The marketing dollars that the city council and the administration has spent on promoting MWBEs, clearly they have failed. Because even that one message, the community didn't understand. And we had no activism in community-based organizations. So many of African immigrants are Muslim. We should be organizing and mobilizing in the mosques where they pray, where they are at. We need to come to them. And you know, the public advocate sits on the city's pension board. And I have been working with Greg Floyd, with a lot of the uh, African-American Latino emerging managers on trying to push 
investment in for emerging managers and, and black and brown managers who are going to then invest in black and brown small businesses. And, and again, those numbers are abysmal. Thank you.